Hello everyone. Let us start. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. I hope all of you are doing well. Okay. So last time we talked about uh, multi-tape Turing machines. Okay, any questions uh, from that part? Do you have any um, questions? Sir? Yes. I just, uh, for the multi-tape Turing machine, how would we write the configurations? How would we write configurations? Oh, great. Um, so for a single tape Turing machine, we have a configuration where uh, we have the tape contents. Okay. In the state of the machine and we have the head position. So we would have all such things again in a multi-tape Turing machine. So for example, in a single tape Turing machine, something like this, 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, 2, 5, one zero zero one. For example, it is it is the configuration of of a single tape Turing machine, uh, which means that the head of since since there is only one one tape, uh, then there's one head in the Turing machine, and that head is pointing to this position, right? On, on this, so these are the symbols which already have. I mean, machine has already passed somehow, and the current state is Q five, right? So in a multi-tape tuning machine, we would have, so this is for, for, for tape one. Multi-tape, we would have uh, some similar things for all K tapes. So together, that would be called one configuration. Okay, sir, thank you. So with this, for example, the Turing machine moves to another configuration, uh, then you have to make all the appropriate changes. Okay. So that's the difference between a multi tape Turing machine and, and single tape Turing machine. Um, but what is important now is that multi tape Turing machines are computationally, so if you have multi tape Turing machine, these are computationally equivalent, computationally equivalent to single tape Turing machines. Right. So there is no computational difference between multi tape Turing machines and single tape Turing machines. For example, if a language L is cited by a K tape Turing machine, then it is same as saying that L is decided by a Turing machine. Okay, so it is not important to say K tape or two tapes or three tapes or four tapes. It's same. Okay. So, for example, if a, if a language is decidable, if, this, if the language is decided by a Turing machine, if it is a decidable language, uh, then it doesn't matter if it is uh, decided by a single tape Turing machine or a multi tape. It's, it's the same thing. Okay. So, 
this is this is important fact. Uh, so there is no computational. I mean, from the point of view of computation, they are equal. Uh, but from the point of complexity, they are not equal. For example, if something can be done on a multi-taping machine in some given time, in order to perform exactly the same task on a single tape tearing machine, it will take more time. Okay? And in some cases, it takes a lot more time. Uh, but it is impossible that something that can be computed on a multi tapering machine, this cannot be computed on a single. It's, a, it's impossible. So everything that can be computed on a multi tapering machine, it can be computed on a single tape tearing machine and vice versa. So you can always bring a single tape tearing machine uh, I mean, a language that can be decided by a single computing machine, you can decide it by a multi computing machine. Uh, but so it, it, is, it is not the point that, that it is not decided that we will add some computational power. No, we are not adding any computational power. What we are adding is the, is the efficiency. Okay. So if we have something that is accepted or decided by a multi computing machine, uh, then deciding or doing exactly the same thing on a single tape uh, may take more time. Okay. Computationally, they are similar. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So then last time I said that in next class, we would talk about uh, non-deterministic push. Okay, so non-deterministic Turing machines are, are very special. Like when we talked about finite automata, we talked about DFA, which was the deterministic finite automata. We also talked about NFA. When we talked about DDA, then we did not talk, I mean, we did not explicitly talk about uh, DPDA and NPDA. Which is the deterministic pushdown automata and non-deterministic pushdown automata, um, but there are there are, I mean, there are equivalent deterministic and non-deterministic machine for for pushdown automata as well, and and we also already have seen for finite automata, right? So similarly, when we talk about tearing machines, we have just the tearing machine, sometimes called DTM for deterministic tearing machines. And we have NTMs, which are the non-deterministic tuning machines. Okay. Uh, so whatever that we have talked about so far is, is about deterministic tuning machines. So whenever we say a tuning machine, whenever we write TM or we just say tuning machine, it means deterministic tuning machine. Okay. And if you have to say that the machine we are talking about or working with is non-deterministic, we need to explicitly mention that it is not deterministic. Okay. Now I will explain that what does it mean by non-determinism in Turing machines. Uh, the concept is very similar to what we have done for the finite automata, uh, but it's more. I mean, I mean, it has more things to do with it. Right. So let's see how this non-determinism works. Uh, how does it work with Turing uh, machines? So. So if I say that I have an, an NTM or a non-determinist security machine, then it is defined in, in the expected way, in a very similar way. Uh, for example, we know that the only difference that we will have in, uh, between a DTM and non uh, and DTM and, a, and an NTM would be the transition function, right? So let's talk about what does, how does this transition function look like? So the transition function of a deterministic Turing machine looks like this. It takes, it, it, it drives, it needs to know, <clears throat> it needs to know that what is the current state of the machine and what is the current symbol on the tape. And then based on this information, it tells us that what is the next state and what would be the, what would be symbol that it, it, it would write on, um, on the Turing machine and it needs to know in which direction it will go, either to the left in direction or to the right in direction, right? Okay, this is for the deterministic. In the non-deterministic tuning machine, we have 
very similar thing that we have the transition function. It, it, it requires to know what is the current state. It requires to know what is the current symbol that the machine is reading on the tape. And based on this information, it has to know what is the, what is the next state, what is the next symbol, and what would be the direction of the motion of the head on the tape. Uh, but all of this in the power state. Okay, so you see the difference. The difference in between deterministic Turing machine and non-deterministic Turing machine is that in deterministic Turing machine, it is well known in advance what is the state that the machine will go into when it is known that what is the state and what is the the symbol that this machine is reading. Right in the non-deterministic machine, this machine can be in multiple states at the same time. Right, and the exact same concept that we had in DFA and NFA applies here. For example, in DFA's term, for example, there is this state uh, which takes zero and comes here, but it takes zero and can stay here. So it means that when the machine reads zero, it can be in state P, it can be in state Q. So the machine can be in both the states at the same time. It's, it's, it's like both these states exists at the same time. So this is the DFA, uh, I mean, similarity. The same thing happens in the, um, not DFA, NFA. The same thing happens with non-deterministic Turing machine. So we need to know what is the current state. We need to know what is the, uh, the symbol that the machine is reading on the tape. And based on it, it tells us that what are the possible outcomes, what are the possible configurations that this machine can go. And since it is power set, that means that it can be in just one state. One possible configuration could be the outcome of the transition function, or it is possible that there are multiple situations. And it is also possible that this transition leads nowhere, right? It could be an empty state or a trash state or something which is under. So it could be anything uh, that you can think of, right? So we will do some examples and it will become clear that what I'm trying to uh, think. Okay, but before we go there, we have a result. And this result says, this result says, uh, every non-deterministic Turing machine has an equivalent deterministic Turing machine. This result is very similar to the result that we have for NFAs and DFAs, because for every NFA, we have an equivalent deterministic finite order, right? For every NFA, we have a DFA. That means that we can convert an NFA into a DFA. The same thing applies here that it doesn't matter if we have a Turing machine, which is non-deterministic Turing machine or a deterministic Turing machine. You can always convert a non-deterministic Turing machine into a deterministic Turing machine. Even though this result seems like very similar to the one that we, uh, I mean, I mean, it is actually similar to the one that we did for DFA and NFA, but there is some underlying complexity associated with it. And when we will start the computation complexity theory in, in uh, I mean, maybe next week, uh, then we will see that, that uh, th there is a lot more than we have actually described here by this non-determinism and and, and deterministic period. Okay, so before we proceed, any question? Sir, so can we have non deterministic multi tape uh, Turing machines? Of course, we can have. Okay. okay. Is this concept of non deterministic Turing machine clear? Yes, sir. Will we do some examples? 
Um, we will not, I mean, I will show you some examples, but not necessarily a concrete example, maybe some abstract examples, yes. Okay. So what happens, let's say, when we talk about NTM, it is really difficult to display an NTM in, in a graphical manner. And uh, usually it's, it's, it's too complicated. So we don't draw uh, such machines on, on paper. Okay. Uh, so what we do instead, we describe it in terms of, uh, I mean, we, we describe it. So it's, it's more descriptive. Uh, so let me explain that, what does it mean by non-determinism or how this computation works? So for example, Imagine this is the entry point. Okay. So there is a there is a non-deterministic Turing machine N. Okay. And let's say N decides some language N. Okay. So N decides some language N. Okay. And this N is a non-deterministic Turing machine. Imagine there is some string X. Uh, which is in the language L. Since this machine N decides L, therefore, whenever this is string which belongs to the language L, the answer must be set, right? Now imagine there is some entry point when this input X, sorry, when this input X is brought as the input on the, on the tape of the Turing machine. So there is some starting point, right? The entry point because this is how the, the start of, this is how the Turing machine starts. It starts by reading the first symbol on the Turing machine, uh, I mean, first symbol on the tape and starting in the starting state, right? So this is the entry point. Now at this entry point, there is a possibility that as soon as, so, so let's say this X is X1, X2, Xn. And these symbols are written over here, X2, Okay, these are the blank symbols. Okay, so we know that uh, this is what the machine will look like when it, it just started and it has not done any computation, right? So this is how the machine looks. Uh, the head of the Turing machine is on the first symbol and it is in the start to state and that's it, right? Now imagine that the computation starts. When the computation starts, we know that the transition function, which is with the NTM, which is the non-deterministic Turing machine transition function, we know that this transition function can give us multiple configuration. So I'm using the word configuration in a loose way, okay? It's, it's not exactly the configuration that we uh, did for the, for the Turing machines in, in last lecture. Uh, by configuration over here, I mean that it, it, this, this transition function tells us that the machine can be in multiple different states at the same time. And if you remember the transition function, the transition function was defined as Q times gamma to power set of Q times gamma times L and R. So it means that it can give us multiple possible options where this machine can go. And just an arbitrary example, it is possible Let's say when the machine is in Q0, which is the starting state, and then when it reads X1, which is the first symbol that is on the tape, it tells us that it can be, it can be in Q1, and it, it does not change anything. It just keeps it X1. Let's say, let's call it Y. And it goes to right, right? There's another possibility that it may go to Q2, write Y1 and go to right. Okay. There's another possibility that it, it may stay at Q0, does not change anything and still go to the right hand side and so on and so forth. So these are all possible options that we can get from this transition function. Why? Because we have this power set over here, which is being applied to, to this parameter here. Right? So it means that we can have multiple possible outputs. That's exactly what we do with the DFA and NFA. 
Now, it means that when the machine enters, when this is the entry point, when it, when it is it is starting its computation, there could be multiple branches, one branch for each of these computations. So one branch, let's, let's call it A, let's call it B, let's call it C. So there is there must be one branch which should take it to uh, which should take it to to A. There must be one branch which should take it to B, and there must be one branch which should take it to C. Now, once the machine is in A, B, and C, it assumes that this is exactly how the machine looks like. Right now, from this point onwards, what is A? A is Q1, Y1, and R. Now we would see that what happens when the machine is in Q1, it reads Y1 and what happens at that time. So it may be in some states, right? It could be in two possible states, uh, in two possible situations. It could be in four possible situations. In this possible, there is no transition over here. So this branch will die out, right? So this branch will die out. It will not proceed further. And with whatever branch that we will explore, there might be more branches. Right? There might be more branches and it can grow exponentially and infinitely long. Right? But in this process, as I said, that there might be some branches which will die out because there is no possible transaction, transition from that point onward. Because the transition function is a partial function whenever we talk about non-deterministic machines. Right? So it is possible that this transition function is not defined for some particular combination of state and the input. So in that case, that branch will die out. And when it dies out, this computation stops. But everything else is being computed at the same time in parallel. So it, this is basically the tree of computation. By non-deterministic. Okay. So you can imagine that in each and every instance, whenever the machine takes a transition, it goes into multiple possible situations. And each of these possible situations are basically instances of the machine, complete instances of the machine from that point onward in the future. Okay, now this branch is independent of this branch. This branch is independent of this branch. And all these branches are independent. Whatever path that you will start from the starting point to one of the leaf is an independent path, right? That path does not depend on any way on any of the paths. Okay, it does not depend on does not depend in any way on any of the paths, right? So each of these computations will will happen in parallel at the same time without disturbing anything. Now, one may question that since we have just one machine, that how it is possible the two things are being computed at the same time. So the answer is that it is still possible because whatever we are doing is just an abstract model of a machine. Like nothing is executed, nothing is computed uh, in, in, this, in this manner, right? So it is just an abstract model and we say that, okay, imagine that I have a choice at one point, okay? And at that point, I have a choice that I can, I can go either in the direction of A or I can go in the direction of B. Now I say that, okay, let, let me freeze at this point. And, and first of all, let me uh, compute what will happen if I go in the direction of A. Okay, and one, once I'm done, I will come back and say that, okay, let's see what if I start computation in the direction of B. So this is one possible physical interpretation of the meaning of these multiple branches. But on the other hand, we can, we can also imagine that all these branches may exist at the same time. So you can say that, you can delegate some people, some part of the machine to execute in direction of A and some part of the machine in the direction of B, okay? And even further more abstract, we can say that this machine exists in these two directions at the same time, okay? Since this is not a physical machine, so we can make any number of copies. And we say that there is a copy of the same machine at, at point A and point B and that, and those copies will spawn new copies whenever it is required. And at the end, uh, there might be infinitely or I mean exponentially many copies of, of, of these, uh, these machines. And uh, some of these branches will die out because there is no possible transition. Right? Now the question is, how do we know that this is string that we entered as the input to the steering machine is accepted by the machine or not? 
Okay, if there exist, so please read, uh, please uh, I mean listen carefully. If there exist one such path, starting from the starting entry point, somewhere that it ends in Q itself. If there exists at least one such path, among all these branches of computation, there might be many, many more, hundreds and thousands and millions of branches which could exist. If there exists one such branch, which starting from the entry point that is Q0, which goes all the way to Q except, then we say that this is saying X is expected. Okay, and if there is no such branch that starts from Q0 and goes to Q except, then we, then we say that X is not expected. Since we know that this N is a kind of machine which decides L, therefore we know there must exist one path, right? Which will accept, or there must exist a path which will go to Q reject, right? So we say that the computation of this machine, the interpretation of the computation of this machine is that if there exists a path from Q0 to Q except, or there exists a path from Q0 to Q reject, then we say that this machine has done its computation. And whatever branches which are being still being computed or which are being spawning and doing their work, we would say they would stop and the result will be announced by the machine. Okay, so it is enough to receive just one of such paths, either from Q0 to Q except or from Q0 to Q except. If one of these paths is, uh, I mean, is found, then we are, we are good, right? For example, there's, there's a string Y that it does not belong to L, then it will go to the right. Excuse me, sir? Yes. Sir, is it, uh, what will it do if it has more than one accept state? It doesn't matter. If, if it has more than one accept, it doesn't matter. If, uh, that's why I said, if there exists at least one such path, we say that the string is accepted or rejected depending on what the state it provides. Okay. 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 Is this in clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So it is important to understand that uh, there could be multiple possible options for for us to explore, right? And 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 you know that this tree can grow. Uh, I mean, too big. Right. And from our understanding of data structures and discrete mathematics, uh, that for example, even if this if this tree branches uh, at, at every point, it branches in two uh, two directions. Even in, even in that case, we can have exponential number of uh, nodes, right? Uh, so so you can imagine that that if all that computation is done sequentially, then it will take exponentially more time to explore everything. But we imagine that all those branches are handled uh, in parallel, therefore we can save some time. And that is an extremely important point when we will talk about complexity theory. Okay, so this is the power of the non-deterministic machine that it can it can explore multiple things at a time without any penalty on computation. Right. So there is exact there is actually a penalty which we will think about it uh, in later later on, but so you you need to understand this idea very clearly over here. Is this isn't clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any yes. questions? So okay, so let's come back to our uh, result. The theorem says that. Every deterministic computing machine has an equivalent deterministic computing machine. Let's talk about proof. How we can prove it? 
Any ideas? Actually, I've already given the way the proof, which is over here. Can somebody formalize it? Sir, जो एक correct path है अगर हम इसी को mimic कर लें in a Turing machine, uh, is that the idea? How do we know that that's the correct? So it's it's not the proof; it's just an outline. Uh, so we will prove it later on. Uh, but the outline is that the argument, the proof, is by the simulation argument. Proof is by simulation. So what we do? So we have an we have a non-deterministic Turing machine, and what we would do, we would create a deterministic Turing machine. Okay. So we know that when we have this non-deterministic Turing machine, we know that there might be multiple uh, possible branches of this. Uh, multiple possible branches of execution. In our Turing machine, and so on. So what we would do, we would. Sorry, this is not M. This is M. So what we would do, we would say, okay, M tries each and every path that this tree has one at a time. So do you remember, for example, if I give you a tree? Let me write it here. Let's say A. Five, three, minus one, two, zero, nine, three. So suppose I have this binary tree. If I ask you to traverse this binary tree, not traverse. Let's say I ask you to do depth first. What you would do? You would traverse here, then here, then here, right? Then maybe this one, this one, and this one. Then maybe this one, this one, and this one. And maybe this one, this one, and this one, and so on, so on, right? So you you will have multiple paths. So one possible path is five, three, two. The other possible path is five, three, zero. The other path is five, minus one, Nine. Then other possible path is five minus one fifty. Right. So these are the four possible paths. Why four possible paths? Because there are four leaves. So for each leaf, we would have a path. Right. Now what we would do? So this. So the proof of this this statement is that we would create a deterministic Turing machine M. Which did, so, so the working of this deterministic Turing machine M is to explore each and every path one at a time. So it will. So we know that we know the transition function is. Uh, it will give us multiple options. We know that the transition function will give us because the uh, there is a power set over here. So we know there is a power set here. So whatever that it gives us, we will try one thing at a time, and we will keep doing. Right. So we would explore one path, then the second path, then third path, then fourth path, and so on and so forth, until one of the one of the exploration of these paths gives us or takes us to Q except. If it takes us to Q except, we stop. Okay. Now the question is that what should be the order of these paths? What should be the order in which these paths should be explored? Now, there is no such thing that we would impose over here. Uh, we definitely would have some uh, order because if you want to implement uh, using um, uh, using some algorithms, that algorithm then that algorithm would impose some kind of uh, order, right? So one can say that it can be random, okay, fine, but it's better to have some order. So it doesn't matter what order it explores. Maybe it orders in this direction. Maybe it orders in this direction. It doesn't matter. Uh, so whenever the, this, it has some order, it will keep trying all, all those branches. It will uh, 
try all such branches and once it reach, reaches a Q except, then it will stop. Okay. Now there's a possibility that the, that the NTM N that we actually designed was not deciding a language, right? It was recognizing a language. So there is a possibility that one of these paths will never end. It will keep, uh, I mean, giving us more and more options and more and more branches. So that path could be the first path or the second path or third path or hundred path, or maybe the last path. We don't know which one, which path exactly is, or maybe there are multiple such paths. So if, if the NTM is such that, that it can go into an infinite loop, then the resulting deterministic Turing machine will also go into an infinite loop. Okay, so this thing has to be, uh, I mean, considered when we are trying to see. So let's talk about the proof. The proof is very simple. So what you would do, uh, so imagine that, that we have the NTM N, now we decide a DTM M. So what does DTM M will do? So let's imagine this is the M machine. So what we would do, so there must be some input tape here. Imagine this is just a single tape. In this DTM M, we would have three tapes. Okay. The first tape is the input tape. So this input tape is exactly the tape that is on, in, 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 which is in the non-deterministic field machine. So we will have one head, which will point in the input tape. There would be a simulation tape. This is the simulation tape. There's one head over here. And there's an address tape. So what happens is the proof is very simple. So when we have this non-deterministic Turing machine and when we try to simulate this non-deterministic Turing machine with a deterministic Turing machine, what we would do, uh, we would imagine that we this, this M has three tapes. The first tape is the input tape. So the input tape of this N would be copied here exactly in the input tape of M. And this machine M will never make any changes to the input. So we make sure so we make sure that the input tape is never changed. It remains intact. Okay, so we don't change this, this tape in any way. It can read uh, this tape as many times as possible. It can go left direction, right direction, any number of times, but it cannot make any changes to, to the tape itself. Right? So if it reads zero, that's it. It can read zero, but it cannot write anything. It's, it's, a, it's a read only tape. It's a read-only tape. So the input tape in the machine M is a read-only tape, and it can the machine can read from it, but cannot write on. Why it isn't it is necessary? It will be it will become clear that why it is necessary. The second tape is the simulation tape. The simulation tape is the actual tape where this machine M will simulate the working of this M on it. Right. So when it takes one branch of the tree, that branch of the tree will be simulated on this tape. So whatever that it has to do, it will do it on the simulation tape. And once it finishes, once it finishes, it will take the second branch and third branch and so on and so on. Now, how does it know that which branch it is? That branch will be determined by this address tape. So imagine that there are multiple, um, uh, multiple branches. So each branch can be given one particular address and that address will tell the machine that which branch it is executing, okay? So there must be some mechanism inside this machine M which will enable it to know that this is the branch one, this is the branch two, this is the branch three and so on and so forth. Okay, so it should have some pointers in a, in a sense that it, it keep, keeps track of uh, which branch it is exploring right now. Okay, and uh, so whenever it takes one branch, 
it will erase the simulation tape and start the, the execution uh, from beginning. It will move the head over here. It will uh, start the computation in the simulation tape. If the simulation tape ends in, I mean, with this, with one of the branches and with, with the help of the simulation tape, if the machine ends in queue accept, then it will announce the answer and stop the working. Otherwise, it will keep simulating till either it goes into uh, some place where there is no further computation possible. Otherwise, then it will come and find the next address. And from that address, it will try to simulate and so on. Okay, um, so this sir? is the simple. Proof. Yes. So in the simulation tape, if for example one branch leads to the uh, reject or accept state, it will stop over there, right? Yes. Okay, and if it's it an infinite loop, what about that? In that case, the machine will not stop. It will never stop. This this machine, this uh, deterministic machine, will keep running forever. Okay, sir. And for us, there is no way to know that. Is it just that it is an infinite loop or stuck somewhere? It is taking more time. We don't know. We cannot determine. Okay. Is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so this is again not a complete proof. So I would I would leave the proof. Uh, I mean, on you to please read it from the book. It is on page number one seventy nine and one eighty. Uh, so please read it from there. It has more details and it explains that how this address is computed and how the simulation works and so on. It has more details. So please read the proof from page number one seventy nine. Okay. So we have another result, and that that result says that it's it's a corollary. It says that we say that a language if in India. It says that a language is Turing recognizable if and only if some non-deterministic Turing machine recognizes it. Okay. And, we, and remember, see, we do not use the word decidable. We only use recognizable. So it is possible that some language is decided by a non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, but it is almost impossible, uh, I mean, we cannot convert it. So, so, so we say that if a language is Turing recognizable, this implies we have NTM. M L is Turing recognizable, which means that NTM M recognizes N. And suppose we have some NTM M. Recognizes L, it means that L is Turing recognizable. Okay. And, and why do we have these two things? Because we have if and only. Okay. Can you prove it? Can anyone try to prove it? Sir, so for the first part, we will have to take a string which is in L, and then we'll have to show that if it is, uh, if it belongs to L, then it should be accepted. Uh, 
by an NTMN. Okay. Uh, that again, uh, I mean, that's it. Uh, for the first part, yes, I guess. Okay, so we need to prove these two parts, right? So if L is a Turing recognizable, then it means that some NTM non deterministic to the machine can recognize it, right? So we know that. Uh, so we know that every Turing machine. Every deterministic Turing machine is basically a non-deterministic Turing machine, right? Not necessarily the other way. We know that every non-deterministic Turing machine has an equivalent deterministic Turing machine, but every not every deterministic Turing machine is automatically, is technically, basically a non-deterministic Turing machine, right? So we know that every DFA is NFA, but not Every NFA is DFA, right? Every NFA has an equivalent DFA, but not every NFA is DFA, while every DFA is NFA. So we know that since every deterministic Turing machine is NTM, and if L is a Turing recognizable, that means that there must exist a deterministic Turing machine which recognizes L, right? And if such a deterministic Turing machine exists, that deterministic Turing machine by default is a non-deterministic Turing machine. Therefore, we are done with the first part of the proof. The second direction, which says that NTM N recognizes L. Uh, so if some non-deterministic Turing machine recognizes L, then we know that every non-deterministic Turing machine has an equivalent deterministic Turing machine, right? So there must be some machine M which will also recognize L, right? And that's why L is also Turing recognized. So the proof is very simple. So, so we don't have to necessarily describe uh, an NTM. We can just describe a, a DTM for it. Um, it depends. What is the application? Why, why do we want to do it? OK. So, so uh, can you show us an example of how to describe an NTM? Uh, what do you mean by describing it? Like we know how to describe a normal uh, PM or DTM. Yeah. Right? So the only difference would be the transition function. So even we can do it graphically. For example, there's some state uh, QI, right? And from QI, let's say, and we are talking about DTM. So this QI goes to QJ. Okay, by reading some symbol X and it replaces it Y and it goes to right in direction. Right. This is the DTM. Now in NTM, what will happen? We would have a QI and this QI may go to QJ, X, Y, R. It may go to X when it reads X, so Z and left to to uh, let's say K. Okay. And there might be other transition. There could be multiple transitions. So it is also possible to do show it graphically, but showing it graphically is cumbersome and, and, and we, we don't do that. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, we have another we have another corollary and corollary is very simple. We say that a language is decidable if and only if Size, which means that again, L is being decidable implies some NTM N decides L. This is the first part. The second part is some NTM 
in the sides and lines and is clearing the side. The proof is very simple. It's exactly the same way that we did. Uh, so the first part is that since L is Turing decidable, so there must exist some deterministic Turing machine which decides L. And, and automatically every deterministic machine is a non-deterministic Turing machine. So we are done with the proof of the first part. The second part is, suppose there exists a non-deterministic Turing machine N which decides L. So by the simulation argument and by the theorem that we, we have seen that every um, non-deterministic Turing machine is an equivalent deterministic Turing machine. So we can we can create a machine M for N. So if N decides L, then M will also decide L. And therefore L is again during the So the proof is very similar, very similar. Uh, but the difference is that uh, we have recognizable over there and we have decidable. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, but there is some catch over here. The catch is that when we talk about non-deterministic machine, non-deterministic Turing machine, and we say decidable, it means that the non-deterministic machine N, so we call we call it decider. So in this non-deterministic machine N, there might be multiple branches because this is the non-deterministic machine. So when we say that N is a decider, we say that all branches come to a halt. All these branches come to a halt. So there is no branch over here, which, which, which is stuck in infinite. Okay. It is important to know. So not the first, branch or the second branch or third branch or any branch. No branch should be, no branch should go into an infinite loop. Every branch should come to a halt. It should stop. If it is not the case, if it is not the case, then we know that it is not a decider. Why? Because when we would try to simulate this non-deterministic Turing machine by a deterministic Turing machine, so we do not know which path was the one which was stuck in uh, in finite loop, and that path could be the one that this non-deterministic machine um, tries to simulate, and it will go into an infinite loop, and therefore it will not be a decidable language anymore. So it is important that whenever we say that a non-deterministic Turing machine is decide, uh, decidable, but non-deterministic Turing machine decides some language L, or non-deterministic Turing machine is a decider, then all the branches of the machine must it, they must all come to a halt. Is this thing clear? Any questions? Yes, sir. Any questions? So if no question, then I think we can take a break now. Maybe we can take a break a few minutes early. And let's come back in 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. Sir. okay. Oh, good, sir. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, Are you all back? Hello, sir. No, yes, sir. Okay, so let us resume. Okay, any questions so far? No questions? No, sir. Okay. Um, so now we will, uh, uh, you will talk about uh, 
special kind of steering machine, uh, which we call enumerator. So you remember <clears throat> when we talked about um, Turing decidable and Turing recognizable, uh, there was the question of recursive languages and recursively enumerated. Do you remember that? So yes, we said sir. that during recognizable language which is also called recursively enumerable language. So I would just say R E N. A Turing recognizable language or recursively enumerable language in this way. And we had Turing decidable languages and recursive languages. <clears throat> Okay. So what was the difference? So the difference is that for Turing decidable languages, uh, suppose there is a language L. So let me give the definition once again. You say that a language L is called Turing decidable language or recursive language, if there exists a Turing machine, that decides it, right? So I think there's no confusion now that why do, why do we use the decide word decide in decidable? So because we know the, the meaning of decided, right? And we say that a language L is called Turing recognizable language or recursively enumerable language if there exists a Turing machine that recognizes. And now we know that it doesn't matter what kind of Turing machine we have. It could be a deterministic Turing machine. It could be non-deterministic Turing machine. It doesn't matter, right? That's why we just write Turing machine. Because we know that both are both of them are equivalent and, and there are so some other subtleties here, right? So, so the word here, which we have recursively enumerable and recursive, uh, so recursive is, is common in, be, in between these two kinds of language, uh, but there is another word which is which we call enumerable. So this enumerable gives us an enumerator. So enumerator Turing machines are special types of Turing machine, but we will just see what are. So let me define what is an enumerator. An enumerator, enumerator is a Turing machine, okay, which does not have does not have input data. Okay. So in, in many different authors define it differently. So what we can define, how can we define it? So we say that let's say it is a, it is an enumerator. So we have a control. So this control actually, uh, this control actually controls the machine, uh, what state the machine is in right now uh, and, and so on and so forth. It has one tape, which we call the work tape. It is the work tape. So it has a control to the work tape. And it has, some authors call it another tape or 
or we call it output tape. Or some people call it printer. Okay. So an enumerator is a special Turing machine which does not have any input tape. Because there is no input. So what does this machine do actually? Okay, so let me explain it with a very simple example. Suppose I write a function here. You may call it a function in, in Python or, or Java or C++, whatever you want to call it. So there's this function f. Okay. And in this function, we have y. Let's say A is empty spent. Now, this is not a C function or C function or Java function, it's just a pseudo code kind of thing. So in this function, what happens is we initialize an empty string, okay, and then we print it. And then after every iteration in this while loop, we just add one character to it. And uh, so, so so one can say that okay, let let let's make it a more programming. So what it will print, it will print empty string, then it will print A, then it will print A, A then it will print A, 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 and then it will print one A, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is an example of an enumerator. Remember, there is no input, right? There is no input. So there is some computation going on. There is some computation going on. And uh, for this computation, it gives us an output. So this is an out. So you can imagine this is an output tape. There is some working tape internally. So there are some variables and some steps uh, that, and there's a loop and there's some local variables. This, this machine, uh, you can imagine this is the working tape and it, is, it has an output, right? So what happens in an enumerator is that an enumerator is a machine, it's, it's a tearing machine which has two tapes. One is the working tape and the other is the output tape where it does some computation and produces different strings as the output. So it does some computation, then it sends that computation to the printer or to the output tape and that printer or the output tape outputs that string. Then it goes again to the working tape, does some computation. And then when it can finalize it, it gives a string to the printer again and the printer prints that string. And then keeps doing again and again and again and again. So there is an infinite loop internal inside an enumerator. This machine never stops, and this machine just gives us strings, some strings. Okay, this is the basic definition of an enumerator Turing machine. An enumerator Turing machine is a Turing machine which doesn't have any input. It just produces strings. Yes. What was the question? Sir, so if there is no input at any point. So does that mean that the working tape will never be empty? Uh, no, working tape doesn't have to be empty. It, it, it can be empty. For example, uh, I mean, working tape is a tape where the machine does its computation, right? For example, if there might be some steps that it has to, uh, to carry on before it can uh, produce some output. So this is the working tape which, which would be utilized by the machine. So it doesn't matter what is the what are the contents of the working tape. What matters is what is the output from the machine. So this output from the machine is either, I mean, so you can imagine that this output tape is basically a tape uh, which can which contains a string. And after the string is printed over there, there is a spacer or there is some, I mean, some special symbol which says that okay, this is this is one output which this, this which distinguishes one output from the other. Or you can imagine this, there's a printer, you see the infinite paper attached to it, 
and every time a string is output by the machine, that that string is printed on the paper, and then the paper goes on to the next. Okay, so multiple interpolations. So it doesn't matter what is on the vertex. Is this thing clear? Okay, sir. Yes, clear. A very simple concept. Your concept is that it doesn't take any input, but does computation. Now, of course, not all enumerators are same because. Uh, every machine will do some something, some other task. For example, you can write a function which uh, which generates um, palindromes only. For example, I can I can ask you that write a function in Java or Python or C plus uh, plus that generates palindromes of uh, A, B, and C. Right. So it, it it can utilize any characters A, B, and C any number of times, and at every iteration it produces a, it produces a palindrome. What and it doesn't matter what is the order of those palindromes. I mean, it can produce uh, palindromes of any size, um, and it is also possible that it produces some output um, multiple times. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, but what will so it, it doesn't matter if it produces the same output multiple times, but it will produce some output, right? So so you can define a machine which generates palindromes. You can define a machine which generates this kind of output that that I just showed. Uh, or it can be anything that you can, right? So it, you can imagine a machine, a tuning machine, which can generate any form of output that you you can think of. So we would call such machines enumerators, right? Right. Now, since the output is strings, right? So it produces one string, then it produces a second string, then it produces a third string, and so on and so forth. So if we collect all those strings which are generated by the machine, then we can call it a set of strings. And that's why I said it doesn't matter if it produces the same string again, because in a set, we would only include that string once, right? So we can imagine the set, we can imagine the, the strings which are generated by this machine, it creates a set, right? Now, if it is a set of strings, then by definition, the set of a string is a language. Right? What is the definition of a language? A language is basically a set of strings or a collection of strings. Since we are receiving a collection of strings, that means that that collection or that set is a language. Right? And that's exactly what we do. So we, we say that we have an enumerator. Let's say E is an enumerator, and this enumerator generates or enumerates a language. So whenever we say that E enumerates L, it means that the strings in the language L are generated one after another by this machine E. Okay. It may take infinite time to generate all the strings because the language could be infinitely long, but it will generate all strings eventually. Okay, it will eventually generate all the possible strings that are in the language. <clears throat> Is this in clear? Yes, sir. Very simple concept. Now, based on this, we have a very interesting. And we say that this is a theorem. We say that a language is Turing recognizable if and only if some enumerator So this theorem says that a language is Turing recognizable if some enumerator enumerates it. We will do the proof. The proof is very simple and elegant. Uh, but before we go there, let's try to understand the statement of the theorem and see if we can prove it without uh, going into formal details. Can we think about some outline of the proof, some proof ideas? So the statement says that a language is Turing recognizable if and only if some enumerator enumerates it. So we need to know what is meant by Turing recognizable. 
let's go back to our definition of Turing recognized. So Turing recognizable, recognizable languages means recursively enumerable. And this enumerable means that we must have some enumerate. And this is from the definition. But now we have a result which says that if a language is uh, Turing recognizable, there must be some enumerator. And if there is an enumerator which enumerates some language, that language must be Turing recognized. Okay. And remember, we are only talking about recognizability, not decidability. So any ideas how we can prove this thing? Sir, will, will we have to make an enumerator for that language? Yes, we need to. So, well, there are two, two ways. So we first say that, suppose there is a language and uh, we would say there exists an enumerator which enumerates this one. And we would say, suppose there is an enumerator which enumerates some language, then that language must be Turing recognized. So there are two ways, two things. Okay, so the first part. So we show that if we have an enumerator E, suppose that we have an enumerator E that enumerates language. Okay. Let's say it enumerates a language A. Okay. So what does it mean by that it enumerates the language A? It means that we have an enumerator which is producing strings, multiple strings, and let's collect all those strings. It will be called a set A. And set A is a, is a set of strings, so this must be a language. So E enumerates a language A. Okay. Now imagine there's a Turing machine M Okay, there's a Turing machine M which recognizes recognizes it. Okay, now what? So if the, if there is a Turing machine M that recognizes A, it means that A is Turing recognized. But how this Turing machine M will work? So suppose this Turing machine is M, so it will receive on input. So suppose W is a string which is input to the machine. What it will do? It will do two things. It will run E. Since E does not require any input, so it will just run E. Okay. And every time E outputs, okay, compare it with W. If W ever appears in the output. Except. Since we are only talking about except, so it means that this TM is a recognized. It is not a decide. Right? Suppose we talk about a string which is not in the language, then that string will never be produced by the enumerator. And since enumerator takes infinite time to produce all possible strings. So it means that we will never be able to know that the, the string that we have as the W does that belong to the language, right? So this M is a recognized, right? So the, we, we prove the first part of the proof, first part of the statement, first part of the theorem, that if we have an enumerator, then we can have a Turing recognizable, right? So, so every language which is enumerated by an enumerator is a Turing recognizable language, right? Now we prove the other way. Is this part clear to all? Yes, sir. Okay, so the second part. Now the other part. Uh, suppose some Turing machine M recognizes A language A. Okay. Some Turing machine M recognizes a language. Then we can construct an enumerator. Okay. We can construct an enumerator E for A. How? Okay. Now, if it recognizes a language A, there must be some sigma. 
sigma is the basis for the land right so what uh, so sigma tells us that what are the basic building blocks of the language what are the characters of the language right now what we would do we will we will find sigma star now sigma is the the alphabet then sigma star will give us all possible strings which are possible using the sigma right now since sigma star is a set okay we can prove we will prove it later on but we can it, it's 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 um it's enough to say that uh, we can actually come up with accounting for for this sigma star so we can actually arrange all the strings which are in the sigma star as s1 s2 s3 and so on we say that this is sigma star. since sigma could be a, a set containing two or three or four multiple characters sigma star would definitely be an infinite but regardless whether it is finite or in, i mean regardless how big the set is we would say that this is a countable set I hope that you remember what is meant by countable set. And if it is countable set, we can arrange them in some order, right? So we can say that there is a sequence of S1, S2, S3. So we can come up with an order, right? That order could be anything. It could be uh, the size of the strings or it could be anything, right? So we can come up with, with an order. So there, because it is a countable, uh, countable set. Now, remember, there is no connection between, there is no direct connection between these strings and A. A is just a subset of sigma star. We do not know what exactly A is, but A must be a subset of sigma star. So what we would do, we would say that we have, we would create, uh, we would construct an E, we would construct an E, which would be something like this. Since there is no input, so we would say step number one, repeat following. Or i equal to one, two, and so on, right? Since in, since it is e, so it must be, uh, it must it must never end, right? So it must be an infinite. So we would say step number two, which is indented because it's inside a loop. We would say run m. Since we know that already exists an m, right? There already exists a training machine. Run m for some for i. Steps on each input S1, S2, and so on. Yes, if any computation except print. So just print out and that's it. That completes the proof. Now if E if M accepts a particular string, it will eventually appear in the generator, right? Because since M recognizes a so there must be some set of strings which which make which make up a and since we are talking about all possible string over this this alphabet so all those strings which are in a must be somewhere here some somewhere in this list because this a must be a subset of sigma star and since it is an enumerator so what we would do we would say okay let's talk about all possible strings and we take first string and pass it to m if M accepts it, fine. If M, if it M, if M accepts it, we would print it out. If M does not accept it, it will go into an infinite loop, right? It doesn't matter. So we would just say that we will pass all those strings S1, S2, S3, one by one to all these machines, to this machine. And if it accepts, we will just output. Okay? And all those strings which are in A will, will, uh, will be output eventually. That, that's how it completes the proof. So we completed the proof in this direction as well as in this direction. That's the end of the proof.
Any question? Um, sir, in the third part, you wrote, you wrote print out the corresponding SJ. What is SJ? SJ is the one that, that, that is coming from here. Since I use I here, so I have to use a different subscript. I'm not sure which one will be accepted. Okay, okay. See, since M is a recognizer, so it is possible that M may go into uh, infinite, right? So we check. So let's take for I equal to one, two, three, infinite, let's take some string, S1, S2, S3, SI, okay? So for I equal to one, we will have just one string, S1. For I equal to two, we would have two strings, S1, S2. For I equal to three, would we would have S1, S2, S3. For I equal to four, we would have four strings, S1, S2, S3, S4. So what we would do, we would ask the machine M to run only these many steps. We don't want this machine to run arbitrary long because it is possible that the first string that we will pass to M uh, will cause the machine to go into an infinite loop and our E will never output it, right? So in order to avoid it, what we would say that we would stop the machine after every, after every few steps. So in the first run, we will step, stop the machine by, by just one step. In the second run, we will stop it by two steps. In third step, we will stop it by three steps and so on and so forth. And every time we will increase uh, one of the strings. So first we will just, just check one string, then we will check two strings, so one string only for one step, two strings for two steps each, three strings for three steps each, four strings for four steps each, and so on and so forth. And all those strings which get got uh, which which get accepted will be removed from the sequence and we would, they will be just printed out and so on. You get it? Okay, sir, I got it. Thank you. Okay. Because the problem is that this M is a recognizer and it may go into an infinite loop and we don't want that to happen. Okay. Any question? <laughs> Okay, with this, I would end this lecture with a few things that so it's, it's not just the end of the lecture, uh, but I, I have to give one simple note. Uh, and the note is that all kinds of steering machines that we have seen, okay, they are equal. Whether it's a single tape steering machine, or multi-tape tuning machine, or non-deterministic tuning machine, or a non-deterministic tuning machine with multiple tapes, or if it is a numerator, and so on. Um, all those machines are equal. Equivalent in the sense that whatever that you can do by one kind of machine, you can you can do by the other kind of machine. Okay? So you don't add or remove the computational power of the machine by all those variants. What changes is basically um, what is different in uh, in the efficiency, which we will talk about later on, uh, but they are equal, okay? Sir, uh, I have a yes. question. Um, yes, 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 please. Can you speak louder? Said, uh, sir, when you said interchangeable, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I, no, I can hear you now. Sir, when you said interchangeable, so if uh, there are several types of Turing machines, right? So if there is one kind of Turing machine and it runs a language, then it can be correspondingly done in all the other kinds or a few of the other kinds or a subset of the other kinds. Well, see, some Turing machines have a special purpose, right? Uh, for example, Turing enumerator does not have any input tape, right? So you cannot use enumerator to decide a language, right? Uh, or you cannot use a numerator to do something which requires input. So when we say equivalent, it means that the computational power is equivalent. Right? So if I say that a language is enumerated by an enumerator, then it means that it must exist a Turing machine M, which recognizes it. Now that Turing machine could be deterministic or it could be non-deterministic. That, that, that Turing machine could have just one tape or it could have two tapes or three tapes or five tapes of multiple or multiple tapes. It doesn't matter. So this is exactly what I'm trying to say. It does not matter what kind of Turing machine we have. Uh, if you can solve a computational problem by one Turing machine, uh, you can solve it by other types. For example, it does not matter if you make a deterministic machine or non-deterministic machine. 
or if you have one tape or multiple tape, right? It does not matter. Computationally, they are all same. They are all equal. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. So with this, uh, if there is no more question, then I, I have to end this lecture with some interesting uh, aspect. I talked about these things in the beginning of uh, the lecture when I'm beginning of, of discussion on, in, on computation in training machines. Um, so we will extend it. Okay. And what, what, what it is. So, so as I said that in uh, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, there was a mathematician, Hubert, who published his famous list of problems. Okay. And on his famous list of problems, the 10th problem on the list was a problem which required an answer to a special question. Okay, and the question was, uh, the question was that, just give me a second. So the problem was that device, method that test whether a polynomial has an integral root. What does it mean by, so there, there are so many things. It says polynomial, integral root, and so on. For example, if I say x squared plus one equal to zero. So let's make it easier. x squared minus one is zero, okay? This is a polynomial which has an integral solution. What are those integral solutions? So the integral solutions are x is either plus one or x is equal to minus. So these are the two possible solutions for, for our polynomial. Not all polynomials have similar things and not all polynomials have just one variable. For example, look at this polynomial which says a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Do we have integral solutions for that? Yes, we have integral solutions for that. For example, if a equal to three, b equal to four, and c is equal to five, we know there's a solution because three squared plus four squared so p squared is nine plus 16 is 25. Okay, so this is called Pythagorean, uh, Pythagorean triples, ABC, or such integral ABCs, uh, which satisfy this equation, which actually come from the right angle triangle, uh, C, A, and B. Uh, then we say that uh, there exist multiple Pythagorean triangles, uh, which satisfy this, uh, this equation. Now, if I say that, suppose I have an equation which is a power three plus b power three equal to c power three. Instead of square, I have q. So the question is, is there any solution to this equation where only possible values of a, b, and c are integers? Negative integers, positive integers, zero, does not matter, okay? Uh, but is there any other solution? So there is one simple solution, which we call trivial solution. And that is if A equal to zero, B is equal to zero, C equal to zero, then it's true. Because zero cube plus zero cube is zero cube, which is fine. But this is a trivial solution. Are there any non-trivial solution to this polynomial, which are in T? Okay, and we, we cannot, we, we should not stop just here. We said that let's suppose we have A power N plus B power N equal to C power N, but N is greater than equal to C. Is there any, solution to that. And we, why, why do we stop here? So we say that, let's say we have a one power n plus a two power n plus a k power n equal to b power n, let's say. Is there any solution, integral solution for this, where n is greater than equal to three and all ai's and, and b are integers? Is there any solution? So Hilbert was interested in solving such kind of equations, and there is a special name for such kind of equations, which we will 
talk about later. I mean, it's called Dyson-Thine equations. Uh, so Hilbert was interested in knowing it. So he wanted to devise a method. He did not use the word method or he did not use the word algorithm. He said that I'm interested in finding a way where if I, I'm given an equation and I, I should be able to come up with a solution if the solution exists or if a solution does not exist. For example, such solutions exist for some kind of polynomials, but not all kind of polynomials. For example, uh, we can generate solution for a squared plus b squared equal to c squared. Uh, but when the power is three or more, it's not possible. So mathematicians were struggling at that time and uh, they could not find a solution. And, and imagine this is happening at the turn of the 20th century, right? It's, it's like 1900 or 1901 and, and, and Hilbert uh, addressed this thing to a Congress of mathematicians uh, who were together for some uh, to talk about different things. And he had a list of 25 problems and this problem was the 10th on the list. Okay. So Hilbert asked this question and he, he thought that uh, he might be able to get an answer in his lifetime, uh, a positive answer in his lifetime. Or if, if not, then maybe in next 100 years, mathematicians will be able to come up with an answer. So he, he, he gave a hundred years time to all mathematicians that please think about it and come up with a solution. Uh, to Hilbert's surprise, actually he got an answer very early on, actually in 1930s and 40s, he got an answer, but the answer was negative. The answer was no, it is impossible to come up with, I mean, not in 30s and 40s, in 30s and 40s, I mean, people started working in 30s and 40s, people started working on it. And uh, so actually what, happened was that Turing was one of them, Turing was one of them who worked on these problems. And what it turned out to be, what Hilbert was asking for was a definition of an algorithm. Hilbert did not know that he's asking for an algorithm. Algorithms did not exist at that time. People did not know that there's any such thing as called, uh, which is called an algorithm. They, they had an idea that some mathematical method or mathematical procedure, if you carry out in, in certain number of steps, then you, get, you arrive at a solution, but they did not have a specific definition of an algorithm. And they did not know what does it mean by uh, carrying an algorithm uh, to do something. Hilbert, uh, Turing in, in, in 1930s and 40s was a student at Princeton University. He was a student of Alonzo Church. Uh, they were independently working on this thing and they come up with a solution and they actually uh, defined what is an algorithm and they defined that how can one carry out uh, an algorithm independent of any human interference. So he, he actually thought about uh, a machine, an automatic procedure which can carry out an algorithm. So once you design a machine, once you design an algorithm, you don't need any human intelligence. Right? Any machine can do it. So the computers that we are using nowadays, uh, they are intelligent, but actually they are dumb, right? Dumb in a sense that they cannot do anything by themselves. You need to program them. But once you program it, once you tell them exactly how to do and what to do, they would do it perfectly, right? So this is what uh, Hilbert, uh, this is what Turing came up with in, uh, in, in the form of Turing machines. And he did not just say that this is what uh, an algorithm means and this is what a computation means. Turing, along with Alonzo Church, came up with something which is now called Church Turing thesis. Okay. We will talk about later in, in next week, uh, next class on, on Thursday. Uh, so we'll stop here. I think this is the time uh, for the end of the class. Uh, but we will talk about church during thesis in detail in next class. And we will have our quiz in next class as well. Um, sir? Yes. When will we have our PSA 2? Uh, very soon. Okay, will we have at least a week to submit it? Yes. Okay, sir, thank you. Topic for the quiz are, are clear. I discussed it last time. If it's everything that is done after the uh, after the midterm, that is everything about Turing machines.
इस नॉन डिटर्मिनिस्टिक के रूप से सकते हैं Yes, today's class is also included for the first. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think we can end the class. If, if no more questions, that we can end. Thank you very much. I'll see you again on Thursday. Uh, the Thursday Thursday's class will also be an online class, and uh, the quiz will also be on. Take care. Bye, guys. I'll see you on Thursday.